That was impressive. How are y'all doing this afternoon? Everybody good? Yeah, I want you to do me a favor. Stand up, stand up, stand up, stand up. We're gonna stretch it out real quick. I know those bleachers can hurt your booties and these chairs can be a little unforgiving to your hips. So every morning when I wake up, I do a stretch. Katie is my roommate in the dorms. We're in the dorms too, y'all. And this 34-year-old back could not handle it last night. So I had to wake up this morning and do some stretching. But here's the thing. When you stretch, you have to make a noise. Otherwise, it doesn't count. So on the count of three, we're all going to stretch and give our best stretch noise. So on the count of three, one, two, three. Uh. Pop it out. There we go. There we go. Move those hips. There we go. There we go. All right, have a seat, have a seat, have a seat, have a seat, have a seat. Sit, 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 sit. I want you to do me a favor. Sit up straight, sit up straight, sit up straight. Put your feet flat on the floor. We're going to take a deep breath in. We're going to take a deep breath out. Deep breath in. Deep breath out. Let's do it one more time. Deep breath in. I feel like I have so much power right now. Three quick deep breaths out. <laughs> yeah. It's so great to see you guys. I've been hanging out in the corner all weekend long, and I've thoroughly enjoyed watching you like resituate yourselves, carry your Stanley cups around. The most inefficient method of drinking water is in a cup that's top heavy, that just falls over and everybody can hear it in the room. I've thoroughly enjoyed being on a college campus. It's brought me right back to my college days. I thoroughly enjoyed meeting some of you. It's kind of nice to get out of my house. Um, a couple of years ago, my daughter had this, they had like a career fair at school where all the little kids got to introduce their parents for career day. And so I got to go to career day with my, my little daughter, Rose. And so they call all the parents into the classroom and every kid walks in and introduces themselves. So up comes little Christian and Christian goes, hi, my name is Christian and this is my daddy, Doug, and he's an engineer. So everybody claps for Doug the engineer because we, we know what... We know what engineers do, right? Go, Doug. He'd be grateful for this right now. And then up comes little Lincoln Shoemaker, because millennials have named their kids things like Lincoln, and he didn't have a top hat. That was kind of a letdown. So there's Lincoln, and he's standing there. And he goes, hi, my name is Lincoln, and this is my daddy, Jared, and he's a lawyer. So everybody claps for Jared, the lawyer, because, you know, we know what lawyers do. And, and up comes little Rose McGrady. Rose has ringlet hair and this big toothy grin. And she goes, hi, my name is Rose. And this is my mommy, Katie, and she talks to the wool while she's alone. Everybody, like, turns and looks at me and goes, I work in radio, okay? And I'm not talking to a wall. I'm talking to a window. And supposedly people listen. Sirius XM 129, 2 to 4 East every day. We, um, it's nice, though, to get to leave my house and talk to people, like, see actual real human beings. But it's kind of funny because, like, I asked my daughter later that day, like, what do you think mommy does? Like, do you really think all I do is talk to the wall by myself? Because that's concerning to me. Because I'm, I'm proud of my career. Like, I also get to go talk to teenagers. And, like, you know, I, I get to do some cool podcasting things. And she was like, I don't care, Mom. You're just my mom. And, like, off she ran. And I was a little crushed because I care a lot about my career. My ego took a bit of a hit. But then I thought about that little line for a few more moments. I don't care, Mom. You're just my mom. Like to me, my career and what I get to do and how I contribute to society, like that's really important. But to my kids, I have two little girls. We've got a photo of them. We can throw it up on the screen. Uh, they're the cutest human beings on planet Earth. They look just like my husband. They, uh, they're at mass right now, actually. So pray for my husband solo parenting at church with two tiny humans that are more like him than me, which means they're like Tigger from Winnie the Pooh and, and not as chill as I can be. Two little girls, and I think like if I were to sit my children down and interview them about what I do for a living, they wouldn't really be able to tell me a whole lot other than like, mommy talks about Jesus and she's on the radio. And this thing that's like super important to me, this external stuff that I get to do, doesn't really matter to arguably the two most important people in my life. Like the humans that came from me do not care what this human does. Think about that. And it like bruises your ego for a second. And then you think about the fact that like what matters to my kids is not what I do, is not the dinner that I get to cook for them every night, is not 
the money that I earn that pays for their education or for the things that they beg for me to buy at the Target dollar spot or for the Chick-fil-A ice cream that they request every Friday afternoon when I pick them up from school. Like what matters the most to my two little girls is that I spend time with them. And this summer, I have to tell you, this summer's been kind of crazy. The beginning of the summer, my in-laws visited and like, that was great, but you have people in your house and they're your in-laws and that can be kind of challenging. Just ask your youth ministers that are married about that. And then my husband and I took a little getaway for our anniversary and then we came back and then we went to St. Louis, Missouri to watch Bluey Live, which was the greatest theatrical performance I've ever seen in my entire life. I cried the whole time at these cartoon dogs on stage. It was magical. And then we came home and my husband went fishing with his dad because he always goes fishing for a week in the summertime with his dad. And then you can take the picture of those cute kids off right now because it's probably distracting the whole crowd. And then they, they, I was solo parenting. And then at the end of that week, I had to go do a Steubenville conference. Then I came home for a week. And then we left at the beginning of July for 20 days on the road that included a week at my in-laws with a huge family reunion with the McGrady's. And then my husband and I went to New York City for three days so that I could do my radio show from the studios up there. And then I flew over to Pittsburgh to host a Steubenville Youth Conference and then spoke at an adult conference and then drove home with my family, got home, was home for a week, and then came here. I've been gone more this summer than I was at my house. And so my kids, they got to Steubenville on July the 16th. The conference ended at noon. We had lunch. And then it was time for me to flip into mom mode, to actually spend time with them. And even though I'd done all this really cool stuff, like got to interview really cool people in the studios and go to New York and like do my job in the heart of Manhattan and then host this conference for thousands of teenagers, do the thing that I'm really proud of doing, my kids could care less because mommy took them to a children's museum on the Sunday afternoon and spent time with them because that's really all we care about is that we spend time with the people that we love and make memories Like, that's what happens when you spend time with people. It's not just like you're wasting time with one another and it's fruitless. When you spend time with your family, think about the holidays. Everybody's sitting around in the living room. You've opened up the presents. Your uncle's telling that weird story he tells every year. Your grandma won't sit down because she wants to make sure that everybody has something to drink. Your mom's like passively, aggressively washing dishes in the kitchen, banging them around, hoping somebody will come help her. But you're there. You're there, you're together, you're spending time. And as you spend the time, this thing starts to happen in our brains where we laugh and we make like this positive connection with those people we're in the room with. Or we cry as we share a memory of maybe a person who's passed on. We, we joke around, we, we develop these like inside jokes, which I'd love to be a part of one someday. And, and you have these moments of, that was a deep cut for the office fans in the house. So like there, there's these moments where like all of a sudden this stuff implants itself in your brain and these memories are formed. And memory is powerful. Did you know that the thing that triggers memory the most is the sense of smell? Like you can walk into your grandma's house and it has like that faint scent of old people, but also that faint scent of love like her perfume, like I can still smell my grandma's perfume sometimes when I'm thinking about her. She wore white pearl. It's not that pleasant of a smell, but it was my grandma's scent. And I remember her when I think of that smell. Memory is powerful because it tethers us to someone. It tethers us to a moment, tethers us to a reality. And as we remember something, we we start to remember how we felt as we were sharing those stories as we're doing those fun things with our family, as we're sitting in a room watching people play a silly little game, something starts to happen as we develop these memories. We start to understand the power of relationship. We understand the power of being together. We understand what it means to spend time. And you don't necessarily have to be doing something, being productive. You just simply are with others. My daughters got to actually see me at the Steubenville Youth Conference do some of the hosting, and they got to dance on the stage at the end. It was like the coolest day ever. I was so excited. After after the mass ended, my five-and-a-half-year-old Rose, she said, Mom, is this what mass is always like here? 
And I was like, yeah, this is how it should be all the time, right? Like this much praise, this much worship. The next day, we went to Idlewild, which is this really cool little children's theme park, like 45 minutes outside of Pittsburgh. And my daughter, Claire, kept begging. I think we spent half of the day riding the carousel. All she wanted to do was ride the carousel. And so around and around and around, we went on the carousel. And she was just, I mean, all she wanted to do was sit on this little plastic horse that I was not entirely sure was up to safety code and go around and around and around. And it was a Monday in July, so there weren't a whole lot of people there. We sat on it for like 30 minutes, just the two of us. And I'm fairly certain it's going to be one of those like core memories, a la Inside Out, that she'll remember for the rest of her life. Because even though I'd been doing all these cool things, she just wanted to spend time. That's how you develop relationship. That's how you make those memories. And I'm clearly building up to something here. And now we'll talk about the Lord. See, we have to spend time with Jesus. And all of us have been up here telling you stories about our lives and telling you stories about the church and trying to impart upon you, like, do you know how much Jesus loves you? I don't think we do. Because if we fully comprehended how much Jesus loves us, we, we wouldn't be able to stand it. It's one of those things that we, we have to spend our entire lives trying to contemplate intentionally. And the only way to do that, the only way to form the memories with the Lord, the same way we form those memories with our family on holidays, or when we take our kids to theme parks in Pittsburgh, or, or when you're sitting with a youth group and you're sharing conversations, when you're hanging out with your friends at the end of the school day, waiting for your ride to show up, when you're on the bus headed to the game, or when you're in your room alone scrolling on the phone that simulates relationships but can never satisfy the desires of our heart, right? When we form these memories and these relationships, we are satisfied. And the Lord wants that for us. He wants to form memories with us. He wants to grow in relationship with us. And the only way that can happen is if you actually spend time with him. And then comes the big question, right? Well, how do you spend time with Jesus? Well, you pray. And I know that sounds like a super simplistic answer. Like, ah, you should just pray a little bit more. But that's the answer. Like, you can't say, I love Jesus and Jesus loves me. Yay, Steubenville. And then never pray when you leave here tomorrow. We will have failed at our job if you walk out of here tomorrow and don't think to yourself, I really need to take a little bit more time talking to Jesus. Your youth ministry might have the coolest t-shirts and the best pizza and the nicest youth room, but if you never actually sit down and spend time telling Jesus what's going on in your life and then listening to him say something back to you, then your youth ministry is a sham. If you have a priest in your parish who has a gazillion and one things going on programmatically and gives the best homilies in the world, and he's not talking to Jesus every single day, that's a priest I'm worried about. If you're a young person who actually wants to dive further and further into an understanding of what it means to be holy, it is not optional. You have to pray. And when we say, oh, you have to pray, I'm not saying you need to go make a holy hour every single day like you've joined the convent. I'm, I'm not saying you have to have these beautiful Shakespearean phrases that you offer to the Lord, oh, thou God among us. I'm saying you have to get over yourself and realize that Jesus just wants to spend time with you. He wants to take you to a carousel and ride around and around and around and just laugh and just delight in you being there and just watching you be with him. Because as we sat on that carousel at Idlewild in the heat of the day, it was my 34th birthday, and I decided on my 34th birthday not to nap off the conference that I just hosted, not to convince my husband to take the kids to the pool, but realize my kids just want to spend time with me. So I'm sitting on a carousel on the day I turned 34, doing the most childish thing I possibly could because it was delighting my child. And I'm not, I'm not telling you that because I want you to think, wow, she's a really good mom, although I am. <laughs> I'm telling you that because as I watched her smile and laugh 
and throw her hands up in the air and stress me out because I thought she was going to fall off the side. That time spent with her, I fell a little bit more in love with this little tiny girl that is my child. When you spend time with God, it is always productive. Even if you think to yourself, I didn't get anything out of that prayer. Yeah, you did. You spend time talking to the creator of the universe who looks at you and goes, wow, look at them. When you think that your prayer is fruitless because you didn't hear God say anything back to you, it's okay. He comes in that quiet, subtle moment where he nudges you a little bit closer to what it is that you're called to. It's not always this big, booming voice, my child, do this. Most of the time, it's just this quiet push in the right direction. When we pray, we are doing the most productive thing we could ever do. And in a society that is constantly consumed by what we do and what we produce, what better thing for a room full of young people to do than commit themselves to actually spending time with God who wants to make those memories with you. There's a song that's like super popular right now in worship, The Goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. And when we pray that song every single time, I start to think of the memories that I have made with God. You have memories with God. Moments when you felt his tender love. Moments when you've known he is present to you. Moments when he's guided and directed your steps. And if you're thinking, I, I, don't, I don't know if I have those moments, Katie. Okay, well, let's make some memories with the Lord. Talk to him. Go into your room, turn your phone off, turn off the overhead light, flip on a lamp, open up sacred scripture, and just read a few passages. Ask your mom to drop you off at the Adoration Chapel after school. And after she's had the heart attack from shock and picked herself up off the floor, invite her to come with you. Talk to Father. Talk to the, the sisters in your parish. Talk to your youth ministers and mentors in faith and ask them, how do you spend time talking to the Lord and learn from them? If you want to be able to say, God, all my life you have been faithful and all my life you have been so, so good, you actually have to spend time talking to God so you can see how he's been faithful. Now, I keep saying talking to God, talking to God. That's what prayer is. But that truly is what it is. St. Therese of Lisieux, who, by the way, did nothing productive with her life. And I can say that because she would say it too. Therese of Lisieux, whose mother passed away when she was very young, had this deep, deep devotion, this deep, deep faith, went to Rome to ask the Pope so she could be a nun early, enters the Carmelites, the cloistered Carmelites at 16 years old, leaves behind the world, is diagnosed with tuberculosis, a consumptive disease, incredibly painful, dies at 24 years old, having written just her spiritual autobiography. And she's a doctor of the church. And like doctors of the church, we don't play around when we name doctors of the church. Like these are people who wrote theology that changes how we live as Catholics. Thomas Aquinas, St. Augustine, St. Anthony of Padua, not just for finding your lost keys, folks. The guy was a mystic. And here's Therese of Lisieux, 24 years old, a Carmelite who died from coughing, and she's a doctor of the church. And you know why? John Paul II, also a saint. How cool is it that, like, saints, canonized saints, we have such a cool church. Relics can be really confusing to explain to little kids, but we have such a cool church. And here's John Paul II, and at her canonization mass, he said that she's a doctor of the church, or the, the, the mass declaring her a doctor of the church. He didn't canonize her. He declared her a doctor of the church. And he says it was six words that made her a doctor of the church. Six words. I have said a lot more than six words. I might have a shot, right? Six words that made her a doctor of the church. And they were the words that she said as she was dying when the other sisters in the convent, they came to her and they were talking to her about her prayer life, talking to her about how much she loved Jesus, even though she's suffering in this bed, how many memories she had made with the Lord and fallen in love with him. And they said, sister, sister, what's the secret to holiness? What's the secret to holiness? And she looks at them and she goes, it is love alone that counts. Six words. It is love alone that counts. 
And the only way that we can get to know the love of God is to spend time with him and to make memories with him. To tell him how your day is going. Hey, Jesus, it's kind of rough right now. I'd love it if you'd be with me. Hey, Lord, praise God. I had this incredible moment of joy. Hey, Jesus, this person is really struggling. Could you be with them? There's a great four-letter word that we can use to remember how to pray. When we want to actually spend time with God, it's, it's the rapt method of prayer, R-A-P-T. When you pray, you're rapt with attention. You're focused. You're, you're dialed in. You're, you're making time for the Lord. And every letter, of course, stands for something, repentance. You go to the Lord and you say, I'm sorry, God, I've messed up. I said this, I did that, I thought this, I missed out on this. I ran from you. That's what sin is. I ran from your love. I'm sorry, Lord. You repent. And then you adore, A. God, you are good. And my God, I am so profoundly amazed at who you are. You just adore him. It's the easiest way to pray. It's just like showering praise upon the creator of the universe. Like sometimes when I'm like stuck in prayer, I'll be like, thank you, God, for the bugs. Thank you, God, for blades of grass. Thank you, God, for the clouds above that are offering a small bit of shade. Like, you can just praise God for everything in this world. Adore him. And then P, you petition. We ask God for things, but not like he's this cosmic vending machine, like I can go to God with my quarter prayer and get out this $100 miracle. But like, I ask the Lord for his will to be done. Lord, this person is sick. If it be your will, bring them healing. Lord, Help me as I'm about to take this Spanish test that I remember all of the conjugations. That prayer never seemed to be answered, by the way. <laughs> Lord, give me strength in this moment to, to be courageous with my faith. You petition God. And then finally, you thank God. You thank God. Blessed Solanus Casey would often say, thank God ahead of time. Thank God before the blessings have even been showered upon you because you can be sure that they will come. We make memories with God when we are wrapped with attention and we focus on him. And those memories, they remind us of his goodness. And there's nothing stronger than being able to hold on to the memory of God's love, the reality of God's love, in a moment of struggle, in a moment of joy. It was at a Steubenville Youth Conference in Rochester, Minnesota last year, the night before my 33rd birthday, when Father Augustino Torres was processing through the crowd with the monstrance, giving us moments of encounter, and he walked up to me and he just, he gave me like a solid minute with Jesus, just holding the monstrance above my head, touching me with the edge of his humoral veil, just giving me this intimate encounter with our Lord. And like, I can bring myself back in my mind to that moment, feeling so much consolation, feeling so much joy, feeling so much healing. Every single time you pray, even if it's just a quick little Jesus, I trust in you, or a full-blown holy hour at a youth conference, or, or five minutes on the way to school and you ask your mom to pray a decade of the rosary with you. You ask your dad to just say a, a, a moment of prayer over you before you step into the halls of a school that might not be super easy. Every single moment of prayer you are building that relationship with God. It's not a part of your relationship with God. It is your relationship with God. And of all the stuff we're going to talk about this weekend, I, I just, I really, really hope you take to heart this idea that he loves you, which means he wants to spend time with you. And that is the most productive thing you could ever do, is allow yourself to rest in his presence.